Howdy folks, it's me, Josh, and oh my goodness I'm almost done. You know, I'm kinda tired of the only music I'm able to listen to being Z Plays Piano, volumes 1 through 634. I get you like the piano dude, but jeez, it's about time I get to leave this place. Okay, so I finished the Japan video, so now the last video on my to-do list is... What if the Turks lost the Turkish War of Independence? Okay, let's do this. So, the year is 1919, and the Ottoman Empire had been declining for well over a century at this point. They had suffered a long string of uprisings after revolts, after military humiliations, to the point that they had been dubbed the Sick Man of Europe. In the late 19th century, though, the Ottomans began attempts at reform, with Sultan Abdul Hamid II creating a new constitution in 1876, before abolishing it a couple years later, returning to absolute rule. This move pissed off a ton of liberals in the Ottoman Empire who wanted to return to constitutional government, which would ultimately lead to the rise to prominence of a bunch of liberals called the Young Turks. <clears throat> the Young Turks. In 1908, the Young Turks would lead a revolution that would come to be known as the Young Turk Revolution, deposing the Sultan, who came back a year later before being deposed again, being replaced by his half-brother, Mehmed V, who only really acted as a figurehead for the new Young Turk government. However, with all of this chaos unfolding in the Ottoman Empire, several states in the Balkans decided to take advantage of the situation, with Bulgaria declaring independence from Ottoman vassalage and Austria-Hungary annexing their occupied region of Bosnia. I'm sure no one will care about that. However, because of the Young Turk government's insistence on Turkish nationalism, many Christians in Macedonia were given practically no autonomy, which would cause them to grow increasingly dissatisfied with the Ottoman rule. And so, the Balkan states, wanting to liberate their respective people from Ottoman rule, decided to intervene, resulting in the First Balkan War of 1912. And it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that the Balkan states completely destroyed the Ottomans, who, the very next year, because of internal divisions between the Young Turks, would end up experiencing a coup with the country coming under the control of the Triumvirate of the Three Pashas. Enver Pasha, who helped lead the coup, would become the Minister of War, Kemal Pasha would become the Minister of the Navy, and Talat Pasha would become Grand Vizier, with the country essentially coming under a military dictatorship. One year and one more Balkan War later, tensions that had arisen between Serbia and Austria over the latter's annexation of Bosnia, a land filled with Serbs, would end up leading to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, sparking the First World War. The three Pashas were torn on joining the war. On the one hand, Enver, seeing the early gains of Germany, wanted to join the Central Powers in order to get with the winning side, but Talat wanted to stay neutral in order to avoid internal tension. And since Talat was the Grand Vizier, the most powerful position in the Ottoman Empire, there wasn't really much that Enver could do. Oh wait, Enver just bought a couple ships from Germany and blew up a bunch of Russian ports on the Black Sea. Well, guess they're at war now. The Ottomans joined the war in October of 1914, and once again they were completely destroyed. Despite some victories in the Caucasus, the Ottomans would see major defeats, particularly in Mesopotamia and the Levant. However, when Entente troops landed in Gallipoli in order to try to take Constantinople, the Ottomans would see their only real victory of the war, successfully fending off the Entente in the Battle of Gallipoli. And, through the battle, the actions of one Mustafa Kemal would lead to his rise to prominence in the military, being heralded as a war hero. Meanwhile, the Arabs, who also weren't too happy about Ottoman rule, successfully revolted with help from the Entente, who immediately went back on their promises to protect their own interests by carving the Middle East up for themselves. But after facing numerous defeats in the Macedonian front against Greece and seeing the collapse of the Central Powers in 1918, the Ottoman Empire would surrender, signing the Armistice of Mudros on October 30th, 1918, whose terms, in particular, included the vague right of Entente powers to occupy Turkish territory in case of disorder. 
After the war, the Entente began drawing up plans on how to divide the Ottoman Empire. The lands in the Levant and Mesopotamia would be divided as per the Sykes-Picot Agreement, but the fate of Anatolia was less clear. The Entente powers had very conflicting interests in Anatolia, and disagreements would end up stalling the negotiations. However, despite the many different claims in the region, the one country whose claims meant the most to them, historically, ethnically, and religiously, was Greece. The Greeks had an intense rivalry with the Turks, stemming all the way back to the days of the Greek Byzantine Empire and the Turkic Seljuk invasions. And it would be in 1452 when the Ottomans, after conquering nearly the entirety of the Byzantine Empire, took Constantinople, destroying the Byzantine Empire, leaving the Greeks at the mercy of the Ottoman Turks, who would commit terrible atrocities against them. And the Greeks wouldn't regain their independence from their Turkish occupiers until 1821, when, after successfully rebelling against the Ottoman Empire, they created the Kingdom of Greece. However, many Christian Greeks were still under the rule of the Ottoman Empire, ultimately resulting in the creation of the Megali idea, that of a united Greater Greece whose territory encompassed all of Greece, as well as Western Anatolia, where many Greeks still lived. And with the defeat of the Ottoman Empire and the subsequent resignation of the three Pashas, a power vacuum would end up forming with the Ottoman Empire coming into a state of complete anarchy. This was a major opportunity. Because the armistice of Mudros gave the Entente the vague power to occupy in case of disorder, the Allies immediately began taking advantage of it, moving in and occupying Constantinople on November 13th, 1918, marking the first time that the city had changed hands since the fall of the Byzantine Empire. However, there was still a lot of disagreement over what would happen to the rest of Anatolia. In particular, there was heavy disagreement between Greece and Italy as to who should occupy Western Anatolia. And when Greece landed the flagship of their navy at Smyrna, Italy retaliated by landing troops at Antalya, with Greece in turn responding by occupying Smyrna. After the Greeks landed at Smyrna and expanded out into the rest of the region, Many Turks, who saw this, as well as other allied invasions into other parts of the country, as a threat to their national sovereignty, began fighting back in a guerrilla campaign, ultimately starting what would come to be known as the Turkish War of Independence. The Young Turks, not wanting to give up their cause of liberal constitutional government and Turkish nationalism, began to reorganize into what would come to be known as the Turkish National Movement, which would then rally around famed general and hero of Gallipoli, Mustafa Kemal. The Allies, on the other hand, after finally working out their disagreements amongst each other, came up with what would be known as the Treaty of Sevres. Through the treaty, Greece gained eastern Thrace as well as an occupied zone in Smyrna where a referendum would be held on annexation. The Straits, with Constantinople along with it, would be put under an international zone, France and Italy gained spheres of influence in southern Anatolia, Kurdistan and Armenia would gain independence, and the Turks would only truly maintain a small rump state in northern Anatolia. And to say that the Turks weren't happy about this would be an understatement. Due to growing resistance to Allied occupation, the treaty was practically impossible to enforce. However, the Greeks, not content with this, decided to attempt to force the Turks into recognizing the treaty, beginning an offensive pushing outside of their occupation zone, taking much of western Anatolia. And even though the Treaty of Sevres would be signed by the Ottoman Empire in August of 1920, this would only lead even more Turks to rally behind Kemal. Meanwhile, in Greece, society was very divided. Ever since World War I, tensions in Greece began showing when then-King Constantine I wanting Greece to join the Central Powers in order to support his brother-in-law, Kaiser Wilhelm II, put him at odds with the Prime Minister, Eleftherios Venizelos, who wanted to join the Entente in order to gain lands from Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire. Constantine would end up dismissing Venizelos, who then decided to set up his own state in northern Greece, 
before, with help from the Entente, deposing King Constantine in favor of his son, Alexander, and reunited the country before joining the Entente. And the personal feud between Constantine and Venizelos would end up spilling out to their supporters, leading Greece to become heavily divided between royalists and Venizelists. Tensions would continue in Greece for the next few years, but it looked like things were finally beginning to calm down. Oh wait, a monkey just killed King Alexander who didn't have any kids. Now what? Tensions between the Royalists and Venezuela spiked once again with the Royalists promising to bring peace to a Greece that had been at war for eight straight years, defeating Venezuela in the elections that November before bringing back King Constantine. The Allies, though, weren't too happy about Constantine coming back, and so decided to stop giving aid to Greece, with France and Italy, who weren't too happy about what they saw as a British client state extending its influence into Anatolia, starting to give aid to Turkey, with the Bolshevik Russians doing the same. Meanwhile, the Turks had managed to secure all of their other fronts, and so began focusing on the Greeks. However, the Greeks would end up winning a major victory against the Turks when they took the strategically important cities of Afyon Karahisar, Kutahya, and Eskishehir. The Greeks planned on pushing forward, encircling and destroying the Turkish army, but instead, they stopped, allowing the Turks to escape, retreating all the way back to Ankara. The Greeks pushed forward, but at this point, they had been stretched way too thin, and so, when they made it to the Sakarya River, the Turks managed to defeat the Greeks, pushing them back. Meanwhile, the French evacuated all their occupied territories, giving the Turks valuable weapons, supporting their push against Greece. As the Greeks retreated and their defenses disintegrated, the Turks managed to push them out of Anatolia, retaking Smyrna in September of 1922, where they then committed brutal atrocities against the local Christian population, burning down the city and murdering upwards of 30,000 Christians, including the Archbishop of Smyrna. Later that month, seeing the disaster that had unfolded in Anatolia, Venizelist officers led a coup against King Constantine, again, this time replacing him with his other, less dead son, King George II, with Constantine dying only a few months later in January of 1923. All the while, Turkish troops began pushing towards Constantinople, with Britain vowing to defend the region. However, as Turkish troops began to push towards the city and Britain sought to defuse the situation, the Greeks were made to withdraw from eastern Thrace, leading Kemal to open peace talks, signing the Armistice of Mudania. The Treaty of Lausanne would end up being signed in 1923, replacing the Treaty of Sevra, defining the borders of modern Turkey. And the Turkish government in Ankara would end up deposing the last sultan, Mehmed VI, and abolish the Ottoman Empire, bringing an end to the over 600-year-old empire being replaced by the Republic of Turkey. In Greece, the monarchy would end up being abolished by the Venizelist government the next year, before being restored in 1935 and abolished again in 1973, with the country remaining a republic ever since. And tensions between the two countries have remained high, even up to the present day. But what if that changed? What if, in an alternate timeline, the Greeks had managed to encircle and destroy the Turkish army after taking Kutahya and Eskishehir, and continued on to Ankara? With the Turkish military completely decimated, and the Greek troops pushing towards the capital, all hope for the Turks would be lost, who would then be forced to negotiate. The Treaty of Sevres would end up being enacted, with each country gaining their designated areas and Smyrna likely voting to join Greece due to the large Greek population in the region and many Turks likely fleeing the Greek occupation. With victory in the war, Constantine wouldn't end up being deposed but would still probably end up dying anyway, once again being succeeded by George II. However, in this timeline, the Royalists, who would likely gain greater support from this victory, would remain in control of the government, meaning Greece never ends up becoming a republic. However, divides would still end up springing up again within Greece, as the issue of Constantinople becomes evident. 
Many in Greece saw the incorporation of Constantinople as the final step in the realization of the Megali idea, leading them to push for the incorporation of the city during the Paris Peace Conference, though the idea ended up being rejected by Britain, who didn't want Greece to threaten its dominance in the region in the Mediterranean. However, as many in Greece began pushing for the incorporation of the city once again, this would end up driving a wedge between them and Britain, who weren't willing to give up the region. This issue would once again lead to divides sprouting up within Greece, with one side wanting to abandon Britain in hopes of retaking Constantinople, with the other side wanting to maintain their alliance with the power that had given them so much already. In Turkey, on the other hand, tensions would continue to boil over, with the Ottoman Empire still being dissolved, and with heavy Soviet influence in the region, likely end up falling to a communist regime in Turkey, establishing the Socialist Republic of Turkey. This new government, with support from the Soviet Union, would take a very heavy stance against Western occupation of their territory, and so would very likely attempt to force occupying powers out of their territory. However, France and Italy, not wanting to give up their check on British power in the region, nor wanting to give up any land to the Soviets, would refuse, with the Turks, supported by the Soviet Union, attempting to force them out, ultimately resulting in a war between the West and the Soviet Union sometime in the late 1920s. The West, likely gaining the support of such powers as Weimar Germany and Poland, would very easily defeat the pre-industrialized Soviets, pushing across Eastern Europe, Anatolia, and making landings across the Black Sea. After the war, the Allies would remove the Bolshevik government of Russia, replacing it with a Western democracy. Greece would likely annex more Turkish territory, as France and Italy annexed their occupied zones, with Turkey becoming a British protectorate. However, as this war, as well as the Great Depression, take a toll on the European economies, fascism would once again find itself arising in the many European nations rocked by the crisis. Particularly, Russia, who had had a long history of authoritarian governance, would once again find itself coming under authoritarian leadership, wanting to retake their old lands in Eastern Europe. And, in Greece, many people would begin to align themselves with Russia, who had historically supported a Greek state in Constantinople. The country would likely find itself on the verge of another national schism between the pro- and anti-British factions, with Britain and Russia giving their support to their desired faction. And so, as tensions arise between the great powers of Europe, the world once again finds itself on the cusp of another great war. Oh, I am done. So, thanks for watching today's video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to Mr. Z and maybe head on over to my channel too to see more content just like this. Okay, that's it. I'm out of here. Well, till next time, see ya.